Well, here we go again. My super smart phone has run out of battery. And that can be a real problem because this phone takes about 8 to 10 hours to properly recharge. And uh, I find myself in a lot of situations. For example, I'm in a hub airport switching flights and uh, my phone's about to die and there, of course, isn't 8 hours to recharge it. Let's uh, look at the back of the phone here. Uh, let's look at the battery and see what its capacity is and sort of think about whether it's possible to come up with a circuit which would allow me sort of touch down at a power point, grab some electricity in some sort of box, store that electricity, and then uh, be able to recharge the phone uh, away from a power outlet. You'll see some text here. Um, 5.7 watt hours is the uh, capacity of the battery of this telephone, which is uh, really quite good. Uh, that's about, um, well, here's the formula. And it's about uh, 20,160 joules. Um, a watt, of course, being a, a joule per second, and there being 3,600 seconds in an hour. That's the capacity of this battery expressed in energy. Okay, obviously an electric outlet. Uh, I'm in North America, so it's 120 volt, 15 amp nominal. Uh, so what's an amp? An amp's a joule per second. So uh, if you were to calculate out all the energy here, this socket can produce uh, 1,800 joules per second. This battery from Samsung uh, is uh, 20.5 kilojoules. So this socket produces enough electricity to charge, put all the energy to this battery in 11.4 seconds. Well, of course not. As everyone knows, batteries take hours to charge, and that's because it's a chemical process. But it really does exist. This socket here can produce tremendous amounts of energy, I and mean, somehow if you could scoop down here for uh, 12 seconds, you could put enough energy in to power your phone up for the day. So, uh, let's see how that's possible. Okay, what's this? Well, it's a capacitor. Uh, one unique attribute of capacitors, they store electrical energy just like batteries, but they can be charged very, very quickly, almost instantaneously, uh, because they store their energy as an electric field. Now, one disadvantage of capacitors is they don't have quite the same energy density. Um, this is a, quite a good unit, quite amazing. 350 farads at 2.7 volts, uh, even a few short years ago that would have been uh, unheard of. Um, at the same time, of course, the batteries have been increasing their density and capacity and energy storage, so of capacitors. So, uh, now, capacitors lag behind. Uh, they don't have quite the um, same amount of energy storage as the battery. But, of course, the question is, can you use a capacitor uh, as an energy storage device? Because you can get so much energy into it so quickly uh, and create a, a meaningfully usable charger. So, uh, that's basically where this video is going. Okay, so here's the circuit uh, all set up. Uh, this is, of course, the instant charger. Uh, we'll zoom into the details in a moment, but let's just see how it would operate. Uh, obviously, uh, AC cord uh, going off to the wall, plug it in. The uh, multimeter is reading the voltage across the capacitors. Uh, I have an iPod here just being a, a, a timer to see how fast it takes to charge the, uh, the capacitors. So we see the voltage across capacitors slowly building here. I'll just start the timer as well. Okay, as we get closer to a volt, you'll see now the uh, little USB charger has turned on and it's providing electricity to the phone and, and the phone will start to charge. Okay, well I just passed the 5 minute mark um, and uh, the capacitor is at 3.4 volts. Uh, the little equation there will show how much energy we scooped up and stored into those uh, capacitors. I'll just pull the power cord now. And of course what happens is the voltage now starts to drop in the capacitor because it's now supplying the energy to the cell phone. And the cell phone, of course, will now uh, start to charge. And it'll charge for much longer than just five minutes, of course, because there's a fair bit of energy in these capacitors. So, and that's the idea, right? Somebody uses capacitors, you touch down to a power point, you grab a bunch of uh, electrons, you store them in capacitors, and you charge your cell phone as you move away from a power point, for example, chasing towards a airplane that's about to take off. Okay, so well, f well past the 15 minute mark here, and of course the phone is still charging. Now it will drop out fairly soon because uh, about one volt here, this boost regulator, I won't be able to boost properly. But in this little quick sort of proof of concept circuit, it sort of proves like a touch down for what, every second. I touch down, I can basically get three seconds worth of charging time. So uh, the next part of the video, let's take a deep look at the circuit here, take a look at the engineering calculations and sort of the trade-offs you'd have to make in designing it and um, keep on going. Okay, practical. How do you design that circuit? Uh, obviously, we've got AC in. Yeah, we're ready to convert that to a DC voltage. And ideally, you want to convert it at very high currents. 
Uh, then you're going to need a blocking diode because obviously when the capacitors are charged you don't want the energy to come back and uh, be dissipated. And then obviously uh, we need a boost regulator. Well, not obviously, huh? DC to DC. Um, and 5 volts, that's what uh, the DSP standard talks about. Now you got two choices in this topology. You could say put a capacitor here that would be chargeable up to 120 volts. And then the AC to DC converter, uh, quite quite simply, that should just become like a, a bridge rectifier. Or um, you charge down to a lower voltage, uh, say you know five volts, and you boost upwards. So this DC to DC converter is going to be a 120 volt DC to five volt. That's a, a buck converter. Or you need a five volt. Uh, uh, well, zero to five volts, because what will happen is the capacitor discharges, it'll, uh, it'll drop down towards zero. Uh, going to five volts, those are known as course as boost regulators. And the only way to solve the question of how to implement the circuit is actually to go off onto um, the component databases like DigiKey holds for all their components and uh, do a search for what would be a realistic topology. So, uh, let's... Uh, Take a look at the screenshot here. Uh, one great thing DigiKey has uh, is that you can actually export uh, searches into a spreadsheet. And uh, so, for example, here I just asked DigiKey about all the supercapacitors they stock. And um, from that, I can export it to this spreadsheet here. And you can see, of course, I've got columns for things like capacitance and voltage. Of course, that'll calculate the energy uh, capabilities. Uh, more importantly, you can also then calculate uh, items such as a volumetric. So obviously we want to store the most amount of energy in the smallest volume uh, realistically possible. And then of course the final column is price, because that's the other axis in any practical engineering problem is you've got to hit the right price point. So I don't want to spend too much money, uh, I want to be able to charge as much energy as possible into the cell phone, and I want the package of electronics to be as small as possible. Now, one excellent thing about spreadsheets, and often you don't think of a spreadsheet as an engineering tool, but it's really handy because you can put formulas into it. You take all this data, I, you run some formulas and it'll pop out basically the best candidate. So in this particular um, instance, the best candidate happened to be this device here, the Maxell. Uh, it is a 350 farad 2.7 volt unit. And the reason why it's, it's very appropriate, it holds uh, a reasonable amount of energy, about uh, 1300 joules. So two of these together holds about 2600 joules. Which isn't bad. It's a, it's not, obviously not the entire capacity of the battery of a lithium-ion battery of a cell phone, uh, which shows you just how incredibly good they those also have become uh, recently. Uh, but it gives you sort of the right volume, and we put two of them together here like this, and then you put some say electronics on the side here. It's about the same size as the cell phone, uh, which at least at least X and Y and Z, of course, is quite a bit uh, thicker. But um, that was kind of one of the other uh, criteria in the background. So. Okay, some other practical considerations. Uh, this is obviously an AC DC power supply off the shelf. In fact, I just had it uh, in my junk drawer from a previous program. Uh, it runs about uh, at least a three amp unit. One thing, of course, is the you can charge the capacitor as fast as possible. You basically want a power supply that generates as many amps as possible. Um, and ideally, actually, not so much a voltage uh, limited supply, but a current limited supply. You want to push as much energy as possible into the capacitor. So. You could definitely do better with topologies here, but of course, you know, it's a custom design, uh, but certainly it's better possible. The other interesting thing that sort of popped up in the design um, is this blocking diode. Okay, more interesting considerations of the circuit. Uh, I have a diode here because uh, the power supply is removed, of course, all the uh, energy stored in the capacitor. You don't want it going accidentally this way. You obviously want it to go towards the uh, USB jack and then actually discharge the phone. So, a blocking diode. problem is you lose uh, 0.7 volts in that diode. And uh, there's some really neat bits out there uh, for, especially solar cell applications. It's like uh, the one I used here is from uh, SGS Thompson. I'll just zoom into it here and I'll just pop up the data sheet. Uh, it's it's a pseudo diode. It's actually uh, made out of a, um, a MOSFET and some control circuitry. So it acts almost like an ideal diode with only about 100 millivolts drop. And that's kind of handy. And I'll explain that in a second. Um, so the topology I have in the circuitry basically is a, a boost topology, and this boost regulator from 1.0 to 5 volts produces 5 volts out. 
Um, now, of course, as this capacitor here discharges, um, its car curve is going to be looking exponential like this, of course. And the bottom one volt basically can't be a, 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 a accessed in this topology because the boost regulator simply doesn't produce a reliable five volts. So all this energy gets basically wasted or store the capacitor not usable. The blocking diode is, is for up here when you're at five volts. Um, if you're losing 0.7 volts here, you end up like this part of the energy curve not being possible. You can't get the capacitor charged right to five volts. So by putting one of these 0.1 volt capacitors in, all this area becomes uh, available essentially in the integrated area here. So that was kind of interesting. I didn't, uh, didn't realize those actually existed in the marketplace and uh, they provided that. Uh, it works very well in this application. So, oh, there we go. A little rainy Sunday afternoon engineering in my workshop. Back.